Coffee Break Collection 15. The World of Work. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. London Dock. Extract from London Labour and the London Poor by Henry Mayhew. Published in 1851. The London Dock area occupies an area of ninety acres, and is situated in the three parishes of St. George, Shadwell, and Wapping. The courts and alleys round about the dock swarm with low lodging houses, and are inhabited either by the dock labourers, sack-makers, watermen, or that peculiar class of the London poor who pick up a living by the waterside. The open streets themselves have all more or less a maritime character. Every other shop is either stocked with gear for the ship or for the sailor. The windows of one house are filled with quadrants and bright brass sextants, chronometers and huge mariner's compasses, with their cards trembling with the motion of the cabs and wagons passing in the street. Then comes the sailor's cheap shoe mart, rejoicing in the attractive sign of Jack and his mother. Every public house is a jolly tar or something equally taking. Then come sailmakers, their windows stowed with ropes and lines smelling of tar. All the grocers are provision merchants, and exhibit in their windows the cases of meat and biscuits, and every article is warranted to keep in any climate. The corners of the streets, too, are mostly monopolised by slop-sellers, their windows part-coloured with bright red and blue fannel shirts, the doors nearly blocked up with hammocks and well-oiled nor'westers and the front of the house itself nearly covered with canvas trousers, rough pilot coats, and shiny black dreadnoughts. The passengers alone would tell you that you were in the maritime districts of London. Now you meet a satin-waistcoated mate, or a black sailor with his large fur cap, or else a custom-house officer in his brass-buttoned jacket. As you enter the dock, the sight of the forest of masts in the distance and the tall chimneys vomiting clouds of black smoke, and the many-coloured flags flying in the air, has a most peculiar effect, while the sheds with the monster wheels arching through the roofs look like the paddle-boxes of huge steamers. Along the quay you see now men with their faces blue with indigo, and now gaugers with their long brass-tipped rule, dripping the spirit from the cask they have been probing. Then will come a group of flaxen-haired sailors chattering German, and next a black sailor with a cotton handkerchief twisted turban-like round his head. Presently a blue-smocked butcher, with fresh meat and a bunch of cabbages in the tray on his shoulder, and shortly afterwards a mate with green parakeets in a wooden cage. Here you will see, sitting on a bench, a sorrowful-looking woman, with new bright cooking tins at her feet, telling you she is an emigrant preparing for her voyage. As you pass along this quay, the air is pungent with tobacco. On that it overpowers you with the fumes of rum. Then you are nearly sickened with the stench of hides and huge bins of horns, and shortly afterwards the atmosphere is fragrant with coffee and spice. Nearly everywhere you meet stacks of cork or else yellow bins of sulphur or lead-coloured copper ore. As you enter this warehouse, the flooring is sticky, as if it had been newly tarred with the sugar that has leaked through the casks, and as you descend into the dark vaults, you see long lines of lights hanging from the black arches, and lamps flitting about midway. Here you sniff the fumes of the wine, and there the peculiar fungus smell of dry rot. Then the jumble of sounds as you pass along the dock blends in anything but sweet concord. The sailors are singing boisterous nigger songs from the Yankee ship just entering. The cooper is hammering at the cusks on the quay. The chains of the cranes, loosed of their weight, rattle as they fly up again. The ropes splash in the water. Some captain shouts his orders through his hands. A goat bleats from some ship in the basin. And empty casks roll along the stones with a heavy, drum-like sound. Here the heavily laden ships are down far below the quay, and you descend to them by ladders, whilst in another basin they are high up out of the water, so that their green copper sheathing is almost level with the eye of the passenger, while above his head a long line of bowsprits stretches far over the quay. 
and from them hang spars and planks as a gangway to each ship. He who wishes to behold one of the most extraordinary and least known scenes of this metropolis should wend his way to the London dock gates at half-past seven in the morning. There he will see, congregated within the principal entrance, masses of men of all grades, looks, and kinds. Some in half-fashion surtout burst at the elbows, with the dirty shirts showing through. Others in greasy sporting jackets with red pimpled faces. Others in the rags of their half-slang gentility, with the velvet collars of their palto worn through to the canvas. Some in rusty black, with their waistcoats fastened tight up to the throat. Others again with the knowing thieves' curl on each side of the jaunty cap. Whilst here and there you may see a big-whiskered pole, with his hands in the pockets of his pleated French trousers. Some loll outside the gates, smoking the pipe which is forbidden within, but these are mostly Irish. Presently you know by the stream pouring through the gates and the rush towards particular spots that the calling foremen have made their appearance. Then begins the scuffling and scrambling forth of countless hands high in the air to catch the eye of him whose voice may give them work. As the foreman calls from a book of names, some men jump up on the backs of the others so as to lift themselves high above the rest and attract the notice of him who hires them. All are shouting. Some cry aloud his surname, some his Christian name, others call out their own names to remind him that they are there. Now the appeal is made in Irish Blarney, now in broken English. Indeed, it is a sight to sadden the most callous, to see thousands of men struggling for only one day's hire, the scuffle being made the fiercer by the knowledge that hundreds out of the number there assembled must be left to idle the day out in want. To look in the faces of that hungry crowd is to see a sight that must be ever remembered. Some are smiling to the foreman to coax him into remembrance of them. Others, with their protruding eyes, eager to snatch at the hoped-for pass. For weeks many have gone there and gone through the same struggle, the same cries, and have gone away, after all, without the work they had screamed for. From this it might be imagined that the work was of a peculiarly light and pleasant kind, and so when I first saw the scene I could not help imagining myself. But in reality the labour is of that heavy and continuous character, which you would fancy only the best fed could stand it. The work may be divided into three classes. One, wheel work, or that which is moved by the muscles of the legs and weight of the body. Two, jigger or winch work, or that which is moved by the muscles of the arm. In each of these the labourer is stationary. But in the truck work, which forms the third class, the labourer has to travel over a space of ground greater or less in proportion to the distance which the goods have to be removed. The wheel work is performed somewhat on the system of the tread wheel, with the exception that the force is applied inside instead of outside the wheel. From six to eight men enter a wooden cylinder or drum, upon which are nailed battens, and the men laying hold of the ropes commence treading the wheel round, occasionally singing the while, and stamping time in a manner that is pleasant from its novelty. The wheel is generally about sixteen feet in diameter and eight to nine feet broad and the six or eight men treading within it will lift from sixteen to eighteen hundred weight and often a ton forty times in an hour, an average of twenty-seven feet high. Other men will get out a cargo of from eight hundred to nine hundred casks of wine, each cask averaging about five hundred weight, and being lifted about eighteen feet in a day and a half. At trucking, each man is said to go on an average thirty miles a day, and two-thirds of that time he is moving one and a half hundredweight at six miles and a half per hour. This labour, though requiring to be seen to be properly understood, must still appear so arduous that one would imagine it was not of that tempting nature that three thousand men could be found every day in London desperate enough to fight and battle for the privilege of getting two shillings and sixpence by it, and even if they fail in getting taken on at the commencement of the day, that they should then retire to the appointed yard there to remain hour after hour in the hope that the wind might blow them some stray ship, so that other gangs might be wanted, and the calling foreman seek them there. 
it is a curious sight to see the men waiting in these yards to be hired at fourpence per hour for such are the terms given in the after part of the day there seated on long benches ranged against the wall they remain some telling their miseries and some their crimes to one another whilst others doze away their time rain or sunshine there can always be found plenty ready to catch the stray shilling or eight penneth of work by the size of the shed you can tell how many men sometimes remain there in the pouring rain rather than run the chance of losing the stray hour's work some loiter on the bridges close by and presently as their practised eye or ear tells them that the calling foreman is in want of another gang they rush forward in a stream towards the gate though only six or eight at most can be hired out of the hundred or more that are waiting there again the same mad fight takes place as in the morning there is the same jumping on benches the same raising of hands the same entreaties and the same failures as before it is strange to mark the change that takes place in the manner of the men when the foreman has left those that have been engaged go smiling to their labour indeed i myself met on the quay just such a chattling gang passing to their work those who are left behind give vent to their disappointment in abuse of him whom they had been supplicating and smiling at a few minutes before at four o'clock the eight hours labour ceases and then comes the pay the names of the men are called out of the muster book and each man as he answers to the cry has half a crown given to him so rapidly is this done that in a quarter of an hour the whole of the men have had their wages paid them they then pour towards the gate here two constables stand and as each man passes through the wicket he takes his hat off and is felt from head to foot by the dock officers and attendant and yet with all the want misery and temptation the millions of pounds of property amid which they work and the thousands of pipes and hogsheads of wine and spirits about the docks i am informed upon the best authority that there are on an average but thirty charges of drunkenness in the course of the year and only eight of dishonesty every month this may perhaps arise from the vigilance of the superintendents but to see the distressed condition of the men who seek and gain employment in the london dock it appears almost incredible that out of so vast a body of men without means and without character there should be so little vice or crime there still remains one curious circumstance to be added in connection with the destitution of the dock labourers close to the gate by which they are obliged to leave sits on a coping stone the refreshment man with his two large canvas pockets tied in front of him and filled with silver and copper ready to give change to those whom he has trusted with their dinner that day until they were paid having made myself acquainted with the character and amount of the labour performed i next proceeded to make inquiries into the condition of the labourers themselves and thus to learn the average amount of their wages from so precarious an occupation for this purpose hearing that there were several cheap lodging-houses in the neighbourhood i thought i should be better enabled to arrive at an average result by conversing with the inmates of them and thus endeavouring to elicit from them some such statement of their earnings at one time and another as would enable me to judge what was their average amount throughout the year i had heard the most pathetic accounts from men in the waiting-yard how they had been six weeks without a day's hire i had been told of others who had been known to come there day after day in the hope of getting sixpence and who lived upon the stray pieces of bread given to them in charity by their fellow labourers of one person i was informed by a gentleman who had sought out his history in pure sympathy from the wretchedness of the man's appearance the man had once been possessed of five hundred pounds a year and had squandered it all away and through some act or acts that i do not feel myself at liberty to state had lost caste character friends and everything that could make life easy for him from that time he had sunk and sunk in the world until at last he had found him with a lodging-house for his dwelling-place the associate of thieves and pickpockets his only means of living at this time was bones and rag-grubbing and for this purpose the man would wander through the streets at three every morning to see what little bits of old iron or rag or refuse bone he could find in the roads his principal source of income i am informed from such a source as precludes the possibility of doubt 
was by picking up the refuse ends of cigars, drying them and selling them at one halfpenny per ounce as tobacco to the thieves with whom he lodged. The scenes witnessed at the London dock were of so painful a description, the struggle for one day's work, the scramble for twenty-four hours' extra subsistence and extra life, were of so tragic a character that I was anxious to ascertain, if possible, the exact number of individuals in and around the metropolis who lived by dock labour. I have said that at one of the docks alone I found that 1,823 stomachs would be deprived of food by the mere chopping of the breeze. It's an ill wind, says the proverb, that blows nobody good, and until I came to investigate the condition of the dock labourer, I could not have believed it possible that near upon two thousand souls in one place alone lived chameleon-like upon the air, or that an easterly wind, despite the wise saw, could deprive so many of bread. It is indeed a nipping and an eager air. That the sustenance of thousands of families should be as fickle as the very breeze itself, that the weathercock should be the index of daily want or daily ease to such a vast number of men, women, and children, was a climax of misery and wretchedness that I could not have imagined to exist. And since that I have witnessed such scenes of squalor and crime and suffering as oppress the mind even to a feeling of awe. The docks of London are to a superficial observer the very focus of metropolitan wealth. The cranes creak with the mass of riches. In the warehouses are stored goods that are, as it were, ingots of untold gold. Above and below ground you see piles upon piles of treasure that the eye cannot compass. The wealth appears as boundless as the very sea it has traversed. The brain aches in an attempt to comprehend the amount of riches before, above, and beneath it. There are acres upon acres of treasure, more than enough, one would fancy, to stay the cravings of the whole world. And yet you have but to visit the hovels grouped round about all this amazing excess of riches to witness the same amazing excess of poverty. If the incomprehensibility of the wealth rises to sublimity, Assuredly the want that coexists with it is equally incomprehensible and equally sublime. Pass from the quay and warehouses to the courts and alleys that surround them, and the mind is as bewildered with the destitution of the one place as it is with the superabundance of the other. Many come to see the riches, but few the poverty, abounding in absolute masses round the far-famed port of London. End of London Dock Recording by Patrick Wallace Coffee Break Collection 15 The World of Work This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Song of Industrial America by Sherwood Anderson they tell themselves so many little lies, my beloved. Now wait, little hand. You can't sing. We are standing in a crowd by a bridge in the west. Hear the voices. Turn around. Let's go home. I am tired. They tell themselves so many little lies. You remember, in the night, we arose. We were young. There was smoke in the passage and you laughed. Was it good, that black smoke? Look away to the streams and the lake. We're alive. See my hand, how it trembles on the rail. Here is song, here in America. Here now, in our time. Now wait, I'll go to the train. I'll not swing off into tunes. I'm all right. I just want to talk. You watch my hand on the rail of this bridge. I press down. The blood goes down, there. That steadies me. It makes me all right. Now here is how it's going to come. The song, I mean. I've watched things, men and faces. I know. First there are the broken things, myself and the others. I don't mind that. I'm gone, shot to pieces. I'm a part of the scheme. I'm the broken end of a song myself. We are all that here in the West. 
here in Chicago. Tongues clatter against teeth. There is nothing but shrill screams and a rattle. That had to be. It's part of the scheme. Souls, dry souls, rattle around. Winter of song. Winter of song. Now, faint little voice, do lift up. They are swept away in the void. That's true enough. It had to be so from the very first. Pshaw! I'm steady enough. Let me alone. Keokuk, Tennessee, Michigan, Chicago, Kalamazoo. Don't the names in this country make you fairly drunk? We'll stand by this brown stream for hours. I'll not be swept away. Watch my hand, how steady it is. To catch this song and sing it would do much. Make much clear. Come close to me, warm little thing. It is night. I am cold. When I was a boy in my village here in the West, I always knew all the old men. How sweet they were. Quite biblical, too. Makers of wagons and harness and plows. Sailors and soldiers and pioneers. We got Walt and Abraham out of that lot. Then a change came. Drifting along, drifting along. Winter of song, winter of song. You know my city, Chicago triumphant. Factories and marts and the roar of machines, horrible, terrible, ugly, and brutal. It crushed things down and down. Nobody wanted to hurt. They didn't want to hurt me or you. They were caught themselves. I know the old men here, millionaires. I've always known old men all my life. I'm old myself. You would never guess how old I am. Can a singer arise and sing in this smoke and grime? Can he keep his throat clear? Can his courage survive? I'll tell you what it is. Now you be still. To hell with you. I'm an old empty barrel floating in the stream. That's what I am. You stand away. I've come to life. My arms lift up. I begin to swim. Hell and damnation, turn me loose. The floods come on. That isn't the roar of the trains at all. It's the flood. The terrible, horrible flood turned loose. Winter of song. Winter of song. Carried along. Carried along. Now, in the midst of the broken waters of my civilization, rhythm begins. Clear above the flood, I raise my ringing voice. In the disorder and darkness of the night, in the wind and the washing waves, I shout to my brothers lost in the flood. Little faint beginnings of things, old things dead, sweet old things. A life lived in Chicago, in the West, in the whirl of industrial America. God knows you might have become something else, just like me. You might have made soft little tunes, written cynical little ditties, eh? Why the devil didn't you make some money and own an automobile? Do you believe? Now listen, I do. Say, you, now listen. Do you believe the hand of God reached down to me in the flood? I do. T'was like a streak of fire along my back. That's a lie. Of course. The face of God looked down at me over the rim of the world. Don't you see we are all a part of something here in the West? We are trying to break through. I'm a song myself. The broken end of a song myself. We have to sing, you see, here in the darkness. All men have to sing, poor broken things. We have to sing here in the darkness in the roaring flood. We have to find each other. Have you courage tonight for a song? Lift your voices. Come. End of Song of Industrial America Recording by Philip Gould Coffee Break Collection 15 The World of Work This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Street Musicians by Gilbert Gurdon Music hath charms to soothe, we admit, but not all music and not at all times. And it is this modification of the soothing effects of music that our street minstrel